every speaker today has just been absolutely fabulous. Some of you were introduced to Dr. Lynn Webster, who was with us last night, um, who at least was acknowledged last night. But I want you to know that Lynn is the uh, former, is a former president of the American Academy of Pain Medicine. He is a researcher and a clinician, but he is also a, one of the strongest advocates for people living with chronic pain that I know. And Lynn has written a book that chronicles uh, the experience of nine of his patients. It's called The Painful Truth. He has also, with an award-winning uh, documentarian, produced a film by the same name, it, The Painful Truth, that will be broadcast on public television this fall. We were very honored that last night we were able to see a five-minute trailer for his film. It was the first airing of the film in the country. We are even more honored to have Lynn with us today, and he's going to share even more of the video with us. So, Lynn, if you would come forward. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and you're right, Myra, uh, today's been a pretty phenomenal day. It's almost uh, uh, overwhelming, exhausting uh, to hear um, all of the stories, but also the challenges that we have in front of us. It's, um, it's a daunting task that we all have, I think, uh, to embrace the uh, Institute of Medicine's um, charge and to move forward to try to bring about, I think, a humanity that doesn't exist today. And that, uh, what I have learned in 30 years of practice and uh, in my research and taking care of a lot of people with a lot of different uh, pain problems is uh, <clears throat> that which touches uh, the mind doesn't always work, but that which touches the heart usually moves people. And I think we were um, uh, addressing that a little bit. A uh, gentleman in the back asked, how are we going to make a change? How are we going to um, change the uh, uh, perceptions, the judgment, um, and the way people are treated? I think it is that we have to tell stories. And, and uh, I, I, Katie, I think, was asking me a moment ago, you asked me why I uh, wanted to produce a... Uh, documentary and, and uh, I first started uh, with my book which was four years ago when I started to do it and that was because I wanted to tell stories. I wanted to tell the stories that that really moved me in my career, some of them, I mean there are so many I couldn't tell them in, a, in volumes of uh, books, but I, I chose them uh, because of the spectrum that they represent, and uh, this is something if you're interested, you'll be able to have access to in, in September. It'll be out in September. Um, but also the arc of all of them together tell a bigger story, which I'll leave you with to think about. Uh, but it's still stories that really move us, in my view. And that's what we're going to have to use one way or another if we're going to have other people uh, care. It's just about caring and having some understanding of what people in pain and what we all in this room are interested in trying to um, uh, address and I think uh, achieve in some way. So um, my few minutes here are going to be ab about stories in a way. Uh, I, I am going to show you the longer version of our, our trailer. Uh, but first I wanna <coughs> address something that has happened uh, just, to, just recently, um, you know, we know that our patients are, are being denied. You've all said this, we've all said this today, being denied access, being denied treatment, being denied tr uh, medication. Some physicians are refusing to treat pain at all together. They're not treating the whole body. We just heard that, you know. Um, and and uh, physicians are afraid too. Oops, sorry. 
uh, physicians are afraid because there are legitimate concerns out there uh, with what limited tools that the, uh, uh, that the payers are allowing us to use. We don't talk much about that. And, and I think uh, Bob said it earlier that, I mean, it's always, the discussion is around opioids and that's what creates the um, bipolar views that we have and, and the addiction world versus uh, the pain world. And uh, that bipolar view really isn't addressing the issue and that's about the healing of both, the people who have a substance abuse problem as well as those who have pain and sometimes they are co-occurring. And so we need to really be thinking about how we can change that world against the, uh, the other world, but how uh, both worlds can come together to solve all of the problems because that's ultimately how we're gonna solve, I think, uh, our current situation. And, and the opioid issue is so, so polarizing and so many emotions, irrationality, science, evidence doesn't work. It's not, it's not driving anything. It's about the emotion that is that exists in society and I think that uh, our media is um, latching on to. So my first story <clears throat> is, um, these, these are verbatim uh, emails that I, I received two or three emails from former patients or from people across the country and I have permission to use this and she gave me her photo of a former patient of mine and this is Susan, um, and she sends me this email here within the last 30 days. I hope I'm not bothering you, but I have a really serious problem to ask you about. My insurance is PEHP. That is the state in, um, uh, insurance uh, plan in Utah for the state employees. And they have decided that they're looking at patients that are um, over so many milligrams of morphine total and wanting to wean them down. Now, I've got to stop right here. If you all remember during one of the major um, uh, uh, national elections recently of how we want to keep the um, uh, uh, politicians uh, out of the doctor's office, <laughs> you know, I mean, really it's the insurance carriers who seem to be influencing our care more than anyone else today. Um, I mean, uh, it's not government so much, but it is, it is, it is the payer system. And, and this, is, this is a good example. She says, they, they told me I had to go to basically uh, XYZ clinic. It was a different clinic. I didn't want to put that up. Or a particular doctor that they said uh, would follow their guideline. My question is, do I, have, do I have any say in this? Unless I want to pay for the meds out of, the po out of her own pocket, do I just have to follow what they want? They sent some information on hyperalgesia and how, first of all, we don't know that there's hyperalgesia. I mean, everyone knows that that is a debate. That's not necessarily true. And how, how more meds can actually contribute to that problem, but it's been enough years. I feel like I'm finally in a stable place and I'm scared to death. When I, dis when I stopped my practice and she uh, continued on with one of my colleagues, she was stable and she's been stable. And that probably has been about 15 years, 20 years that I, I, I took care of her. And by the way, it was uh, after uh, 12 operations on her TMJ that uh, led her to see me. So she had a significant chronic pain problem. She says, I've had headaches where the, uh, the pill came up before it could work and there is no extra working room, meaning that if she got nausea and vomited from taking that one pill and she has a limited number of, of medications or pills, she has no recourse. She's gonna have uh, uh, nothing there available for her to treat that pain because it's gone. She's already vomited up. So do you know, uh, Dr. W, this person that she's been referred to? I have no problem trying to wean down, but I weaned down a lot of medications over the years all on her own. I, uh, if I continue to see MG, MJ, who was a nurse practitioner that worked with me for a long time and continued to see her with a, a Dr. T, who was my junior partner, uh, they won't pay for any of the medications. So they're dictating her care and where she's going to be. They prescribe a 30-day supply of oral meds, and it's better, uh, and it better, and it better last 30 days. That's the attitude. It's an attitude. I told them that 
MJ uh, and I had talked about this and that she was okay if I kept the extras aside for really bad days. I told them I, I worked very hard to stay within the boundaries, 30 days. I happened to see this uh, PA when she asked him about going 28 days. He said, absolutely, absolutely not. My anxiety level is so high because the whole thing reminds me of years ago before she came to see me when everything was out of control. And we all know that with the increased anxiety, the fear that she's not gonna have access to treatment does indeed increase the amount of pain somebody experiences. So now she's going to be abandoned uh, because she's not following rules that are so rigid, there is no flexibility in really uh, treating it. So it's a prescriptive outline that uh, is like a cookbook. If you follow it, maybe you can get your medicines. If not, so, uh, it's your problem. So MJ wrote them a letter saying that we had, uh, decreasing, <coughs> had been decreasing slowly and she felt uh, too much, too fast would be detrimental to her. Uh, the case manager told her, told me, they felt she was uh, sort of blowing things out of proportion, that is, the nurse practitioner, and that she was wrong in her assessment. Again, telling the person who had been caring for her for more than a decade that she was wrong in what she was doing. Um, I really will try not to bug you, but I don't know where else to turn. Uh, every, every, uh, ever think about, tell you, yeah, everything, forget about that. Uh, uh, doctor, <laughs> she says, uh, the insurance is through my husband's employer. I asked where the insurance was and, uh, and if they had somebody that she could contact. Uh, even though he doesn't uh, technically work um, because he's disabled uh, there since he, he had lost his leg. So there's two people with chronic pain. I do have a case manager at PEHP. She's been awesome and has listened to what I have to say, but it boils down to this insurance. It's their rules. Thank you for your input. I'll uh, make whatever, um, uh, uh, whatever work, what choice do I have, but I really want to go back to the providers that I know and trust. That is a critical element of healing. We can't cure most people in chronic pain today, unfortunately, but we can make great strides in healing. And one of the critical components of healing is trust. If you don't have a trusting relationship, there's not going to be any healing. A lot of that spirituality um, contribution is based upon a trust. You know, a relationship, a connectedness that exists with you and your provider as a patient allows you then to tap into the whole body aspects of healing. Uh, you don't get that when you have rules that you know you cannot probably follow. So I look forward to hearing from you. I hope things are going well for you. Otherwise, and she follows up, the insurance is through my, oh, wrong way, direction. He's not open on Fridays, and I was uh, very clear about not wanting to be sent to the ER. She's, pre she's preemptively worried that because of the rules, she's not going to make it. She knows the doses that she's had to have in the past of medicines. She doesn't want to go to the ER. He said that he would take care of her and send, uh, send her to an Instacare, which is basically an ER in, in Utah. Uh, I, am, I am already having issues. I was finally to a spot where things were managed reasonably well. Uh, and last Friday, I had a crisis. No doctor, couldn't access anybody, no medication, no morphine, nothing. I called MJ, a different person, and she saw her. She gave her some ketamine as an alternative because she couldn't give her any opioids for fear that there would be some kind of uh, rule that she would have broken then that would have kicked her out of uh, receiving any treatment at all downstream. So if I want coverage of the medications, they want the number to be less than 150 milligrams. Dr. Foley says there's no evidence for having these maximum limits, but now the insurance plan is telling us what that limit needs to be, or at least telling this person what it needs to be. So I can, I, I can still go anywhere I want, see anyone, et cetera, but they are running some sort of a little pilot program to get patients off of medications or at least below 150, and I fell into the mess. They are making me go to this doctor, other doctor, in order to get insurance coverage of the meds 
If I go anywhere but to him, they will not cover one medication at a lim and only at a limited amount. I'm willing to try just about anything, but I think you and I both know I probably will be one of those people who can't get below 150 milligrams. I let the case manager know because I don't want to have anyone say I'm using two providers. I explained to her that I absolutely do not want to be part of this or go back to Dr. X, the doctor who was pretty rigid. She talked to someone over her, and uh, as it sits now, they asked me to go see him one more time on Wednesday. Uh, but she knows she's just going to be scolded, if not fired. Sorry, rambling. I'd really appreciate my, any advice you have. It's like they... They tell you that you have rights, but they don't put so many restrictions on those rights that you really have nothing. Thanks for listening, basically. Um, sorry. All right. So with that as a background, these I, I, everyone in this room has thousands of these types of stories. That's why we're here. That's why we're trying to make a difference. Yeah, I, I really believe that if we are going to make progress, we have to touch the hearts of the people who are policy makers. And that's why you're going to watch this trailer. Please, go right ahead. <clears throat> scene at Trolley Square, several people have been killed. Among the dead, Kirsten Hinckley, and among the wounded, Hinckley's mother, Carolyn Toft. If we can visualize what pain is, we visualize Carolyn Tuft of Salt Lake City, who somehow survived the pain of three shotgun blasts at point-blank range. I've got a severe pain in my back where I was shot. And that spreads across, not just in the area where I was shot, but it spreads across my whole pelvic area uh, and both um, hips. This is the x-ray of 130-some pallets still lodged in her vital organs. She spends hours just getting up and more trying to just get enough strength to face the day. She tries to forget the pain by looking at the scrapbook of her daughter, who was shot and died while she held her. This is my daughter Kirsten's memory book. Starts with her birth certificate, actually ends the last page as her uh, death certificate, which is awful because it says manner of death homicide. And that just gets to my soul. Carolyn's road to a painful truth is different, but the struggles are the same as with other sufferers. Often the pain comes in one moment and lasts the rest of one's life. And in that rest of her life, Carolyn is like most pain patients. For example, it took her eight years to get disability. Social Security, they, they don't see pain as a disability. It's not in their their little box that you mark, you know. Um, so I don't fit anywhere. She's gone doctor to doctor, been accused of being a drug seeker, and like many, she fears going to sleep, knowing that she will wake up and it will hurt. I get down a lot. I get depressed and I cry a lot because the pain is so bad. And my life, I've lost my life. I've lost who I was, and I mourn not only for my daughter, but I mourn me, who I was. It's a feeling that Grady feels on a farm in Oklahoma. His pain came in one moment after a botched routine medical procedure. I would have, oh, this is going to sound really bad. I would have taken matters into my own hands a long time ago. And. My dad wouldn't have liked it, but he would have understood. My mother, no, it would, she wouldn't have comprehended it. Pain is all day, every day. 
in Florida, MBA CPA Crystal Weaver woke up one day with a pain that has now lasted decades. She'd give everything just for one day to be like other moms and play ball with her son. And not being able to be there for his baseball games, I'm sorry, and do the things that he wants me to do with him, that's extremely painful. Does this feel any better for me? Pain affects more Americans than any other health issue. And people won't listen. Even many doctors will not listen. The ones who didn't believe me or simply told me go home and deal with it, it's soul crushing. And if providers do listen, it seems that it's only to hear that patients want drugs, powerful drugs, and pharmacies that will not fill legitimate prescriptions. I had a pharmacist just flat out tell me, no, I won't fill your prescription, and I won't do it until a certain date, even though my insurance said it was okay, my doctor said it was okay, my doctor's been in arguments with pharmacies, I've had to change pharmacies several times. It's so frustrating. They know nothing about me. They know nothing about the disease. How dare they judge me? If a person with pain goes in and says, I've tried hydrocodone, and I've tried Aleve, and Aleve makes my stomach really upset, but hydrocodone works great. They're immediately accused of being a drug seeker. Oh my God, they know the name of the medication. They want a particular medication. And there's such a stigma out there about narcotics. You get outrage. I mean, it, it's, it's kind of amazing. It, it's shocking. In America, how can it be so bad for the voiceless who suffer in pain? What is the painful truth? A doctor and a journalist teamed up as producers to find out. Former president of the American Academy of Pain Medicine, MD Lynn Webster, and former network correspondent and New York and LA Emmy Award winner, Craig Worth, logged 70,000 miles over a year to find out. Some patients they interviewed don't. dozens of experts from coast to coast and found candid answers. The American medical system is broken when it comes to pain treatment. I consider it a moral outrage. I think that our system is pitiful. We have about 100 million people based on the um, IOM study who suffer from chronic pain. Um, very, very few of them are getting appropriate treatment. These people want to live, but they just can't stand it anymore. They have nothing to look forward to. They, they don't sleep, and if they do sleep, um, they, they don't want to wake up because when they wake up, they, they're in such bad pain, they want to go to sleep. And they get one or two hours at a time, so now they're sleep deprived, they're depressed, they've lost everything they have, they can't leave their house. Um, yes, the medical system has, has failed these people. To refer to it as an abomination is, is probably uh, too kind. We had to travel the country to find people who had the nerve, had the courage, basically, to come out and tell the truth, tell the story that's occurring everywhere, in every community, and in our backyards. They found insurance providers canceling patients using statements from doctors who never met the patient, such as Marty in New York City. The doctor never seen me, he never examined me, and he never knew anything about me as far as my knowledge, ex except for maybe what they showed him, you know, as far as notes were concerned, their notes, you know, and, uh, you know, it really upset me. It felt like I was being bullied and uh, that once again, you know, they were trying to deny me proper medical care. Pain sufferers turned advocates told story after story of neglect in a system where it was to get them in, get them temporary relief, and get them out. Cindy Steinberg helps patients for the U.S. Pain Foundation. Workman's comp is a nightmare. That's all I would say. It is, it, I, the stories I've heard are absolutely horrible. We saw people with tubs and tubs of hundreds of thousands of dollars in bills and refused insurance claims. More doctors refusing to treat or see, 
or pharmacists refusing to fill, and often it's all about opioids. The heart of the darkest disease, the disease of pain. Meanwhile, many patients just hope to mask the most painful of the painful truth, and opioid medications are where the controversy lies in chronic pain. And part of the controversy is that we really have inadequate evidence in the literature to support its use for that indication. We are not drug addicts. We are not drug addicts. All we are seeking is relief from pain. I wouldn't survive without them. I, I, re I wouldn't survive. I've, I need them just to get moving. Which brings in the DEA. People need to know. The DEA needs to rethink their, their policy about how they're limiting the access to these medications. They are necessary. It's, it's not a joke. This affects people's lives. I see that they think that all prescribers are probably the enemy. Uh, certainly all pharmaceutical companies are the enemy. I think that's a um, kind of a mindset that I've seen uh, kind of in DEA diversion for some time. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, that though they, these are our, we have to be very careful how we deal with these people. I know that it's very common for pharmacies, and this has been true for many years, anytime you question what they tell you, the answer you get most commonly is, well, it's because of the DEA. And you hear that from doctors as well. Anytime doctors um, put up barriers to, to treatment of people with pain, which happens as commonly as barriers in pharmacy, the scapegoat is the DEA. And throughout it all, the painful truth is about people, such as an injured NFL standout who talks about his battle with prescription medication and abuse, and putting his life back together, still suffering from chronic pain. There has to be a point in someone's life to where they hit bottom. Unfortunately for me, my third one, they sent me to the state prison. And the painful truth is about mothers. We have to help them. We have to believe them and we have to help them. Daughters. Because right now all you hear about is, you know, all the Hollywood types that are abusing prescription pain medication. The press doesn't want to hear about an 86-year-old woman that's been living with pain for 11 years. What's sexy about that? There isn't. Fathers. Normalcy is not anymore when, when you have someone with chronic pain. And sons. I have to hope that they will find something. They will, because another 60 years of this is it's not very promising. <laughs> From all over America, and all telling their candid stories, why haven't the people in pain been heard? For a long time, people have said that nothing is going to change in the way people with pain are treated unless patients and their families and their loved ones rise up and fight back and demand better care. But the problem is, how can you start a movement when the people who are supposed to rise up can't get medication, can't get treatment, can't get doctors? They're, you know, they're stuck at their homes without jobs and without financial means. And there, there's really, um, there's no way for them to rise up together. And God forbid somebody funds that effort, well, then the effort becomes suspect. There has to be hope, or there is no reason to do this documentary. There is alternative treatment but insurance will have to start paying for it. Often it does not. The military has had some success with acupuncture. For something to survive two to 3,000 years in medicine, something is going on. The Rehabilitation Center of Chicago has had some success with biofeedback. This is how your skin temperature going up because you're relaxing. Mirror therapy. Feels like I'm, I'm not putting any effort doing it and it's not any pain. And other therapies. And graduates patients back into their lives. This means a lot. And I want to thank everyone and the staff. 
for giving me the opportunity to learn from you and apply it to my life. There has to be hope for research, but first there has to be a voice and not just the cries of pain. I'm always going to be in pain. Um, I'm always going to be this crippled person and I'm always going to be poor and have to fight for medications and the right to get medications and fight to just to live. Um, it's, it's exhausting. It's exhausting to be in pain. And it's exhausting to keep trying so hard to be here. You know, I was a relatively young person. I was hoping that I might find a life partner, maybe remarry. I don't have hope for that anymore. Um, who wants somebody that has a chronic um, pain disease that's always suffering? I, I would be a very hard person to live with because who wants to see somebody in agony all the time? The Painful Truth, to be released fall 2015. Thank you, thank you. Um, I, I hope it was pretty clear. Uh, if this uh, trailer wasn't clear, certainly the, uh, the documentary will be clear. I am not defending opioids. I'm not a pro-opioid person, nor am I a con-opioid person. I'm a pro-patient. And today we have limited access to treatments as we tried to allude to here, everyone in this room knows payers limit what we can um, provide our patients. They're limiting it even more uh, today. And I think that for us to make the types of progress that we need uh, to make in the future, as Bob alluded to earlier, uh, is that we have to bring the different fractions together. And even those of us who are not fractionated, um, it's not going to be one organization versus another organization that's going to make, make the difference. We have to do this collectively, but truly, it has to be a grassroots effort. And that's why this is about people, this is about patients, it's about those who are really the ones who are suffering. It's not about doctors. Doctors no one cares that much about, except me, I guess. <laughs> but it's really about, it's about people. And if we can stay focused on that and re recognize that this is a social movement. For a cultural transformation, we have to have a social movement that is grassroots. It has to come from the people who suffer. Now, we are looking at um, documentaries, we're trying to write books. I mean, these programs are all important, but we need thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of voices out there speaking up if we're going to make the change. Today, there's uh, far fewer people who are being harmed from the opioids, and these are legitimate harms. This is a serious problem. We need to get by that, largely because we need to double, triple, quadruple our investments in finding safer and more effective therapies than opioids. We need to get uh, payers to cover those modalities that they're not covering now that have been demonstrated with evidence base to help you. And we need to restore the relationship between a physician and their patient so that healing can occur because it's not now. I want to finish with just a couple more slides. Um, I don't, how many of you, by the way, how many of you saw the earlier trailer to The Painful Truth last night? Oh, so most of you did. Yeah. Um, how many of you saw cake? Whoa, not many. Okay, Jennifer Aston. Uh, huh? What was your question? 
Cake. How many saw Cake? How many saw the movie Cake? Uh, came, it wasn't broadly uh, shown. It wasn't widely shown uh, in the country. Um, it was at the uh, beginning of the year uh, when it was shown, and it was shown just before the Academy Awards, and she was hopeful that she'd get nominated as a comedian in a serious role. Now, I wrote an op-ed about the, uh, uh, the movie, and it reminded me of uh, the Philadelphia story. Uh, Tom Hanks, about 20 years ago, if you remember, won his first Academy Award uh, by playing uh, in uh, the Philadelphia, Philadelphia story. Not just me, but it's written that that was probably uh, the, uh, that, that was the beginning of a major social movement in a cure for AIDS. The movie was, a, was the trigger. It was at least a major contributing factor for why NIH, Congress invested billions of dollars to try to find, us, find a cure or find uh, solutions to HIV. And I believe that we need a similar sort of approach. Um, we know that this happened with cancer. Uh, we know that uh, back um, uh, some 50, 60 years ago, people um, in my family would not talk about somebody who had cancer that that was disrespectful um, and that you were afraid that somebody would think badly of you because you had somebody in your family with cancer. The same has happened with mental illnesses. We still struggle to a large degree with mental illness and the stigma with pain is there too. Stigma is there with addiction. And so for me to, for, it, it's my belief that if we're going to change our social attitudes and really move forward, we need that social movement, grassroots, everyone has to be involved in. It's gonna take movies more powerful than Cake. Um, Cake, I don't think, quite measured up to Philadelphia, obviously, but it may have been the opening scene for a change. Maybe, the, maybe uh, my documentary and other documentaries will be another scene so that at the end of the next five or 10 years, we will be able to say that the movie has shown and we've had a major impact and maybe collectively have an Academy Award so that your lives out there who are those who experience chronic pain and all of us who probably will experience chronic pain in the future won't be much better. I'll leave it at that. I'll open it up to any questions if you have any. Thank you very much. Is that Fitbit steps? <laughs> yes, good for you. Hi, I'm Nora Gomez. I'm a medical doctor. I've been practiced for about 15 years in family medicine. And um, I just want to make a couple comments uh, for thought. One is just in defense of doctors. Um, my experience has been that I don't hesitate, or I may hesitate to prescribe opioids because it's not because I don't understand how to use them. It's not because I don't care. It's not because I don't listen. It's because of all the regulations and the threat that's always held over us in regards to our license. And the license that we have to practice medicine, without it, we can't do it. It's our livelihood, it's our passion, it's our mission, it's everything we put into our lives to have this career to be able to take care of people. And it's amazing to me in this symposium, I've learned so much about the concept of chronic pain and that people aren't heard. And it's true because all I've heard <laughs> is how I now need to write prescriptions certain ways because now hydrocodone's a different category. You know, I hear about how I have to do all these urine drug screens, how I can only prescribe something for 30 days. I mean, I don't do this by choice. This, these are the laws, these are the rules. Otherwise, I'm gonna get questioned. And 
possibly something happened to my license. And so that's constantly held over us. And I would just like to kind of just give that food for thought that ultimately I think that the patient does have to trust us for there to be healing. But we also have to trust the patient. And it goes both ways. And the only way that can happen, I believe, is with time. And so when we're only given 15 minutes to see a patient, it's very, we're very limited in building that relationship. And you know, with given that time, um, and even though you may want to prescribe certain medicines, there's a lot of other barriers that are happening. Um, so I, I hope that we can remember not the American Academy of Pain um, being not just an advocate for patients, but also an advocate for physicians. So that if I assess, diagnose, come up with a treatment plan for a patient, and it may, it may have a controlled medication as part of treatment, that I've got the academy backing me up and saying, you know, this physician is treating this patient appropriately, get off her case. <laughs> um, you know, why does the insurance company listen to the physician that's sitting in the office reviewing paperwork? Why do they put more weight into that than the physician that's in the clinic seeing the patient? You know, we have to, you know, again, I know it probably goes back to money. Um, so, I just think that we need to, um, I, I know there's bad apples out there, but we have to be careful not to generalize the medical community. Um, we have to remember that, you know, we're human too, and um, when it's said that the doctor didn't prescribe, the doctor didn't do this, the doctor didn't do that, the next question should be why? And the why is, really the problem here. Um, and, and the DEA is not a scapegoat. You know, it's not an excuse, it's the reality. They're breathing down our necks. And uh, so I just wanted to make those points. Um, same with spirituality. Um, I, my experience has been most physicians don't talk about it. It's not because we're not comfortable with our own. It's, it's because there isn't time. Um, and you know, with time you are able to discuss those things. Lynn, may I make a comment? Sure. Um, I, I want to talk about the, the fear that is pervasive among providers. I'm not a provider. I was formerly, however, on the Kansas Board of Healing Arts, and I am also a fellow of the Federation of State Medical Boards. About 10 years ago now with the DEA and with the American Academy of Pain Medicine and the American Academy of Pain Management and the National Association of Attorneys General and all of these powerful organizations, we came together and did some research on what is the real threat to physicians with regard to being um, brought up before their state medical board for administrative purposes and or, and there are and ors, being brought before a criminal body, uh, for or a law enforcement body, rather, for criminal charges. And we looked at data over eight years. The DEA <coughs> assured us that we had collected, amassed the largest data set ever, analyzed it carefully, and published it. Less than 1% of all physicians in this country have ever been charged by their state medical boards or by law enforcement agencies for diverting or abusing their prescribing practices. Now, we did not, and I want to say, we did not have access to those who had been investigated. And I know the fear of investigation is very real as well. I don't quite understand the concern that there is in the medical community. I want to respect it. But the reality is that you are more likely to be struck by lightning than you are to lose your license for properly prescribing. And I would say that the Federation of State Medical Boards has worked very hard 
to be sure that there are guidelines so that those physicians like you who want to do the right thing, who want to take care of their patients, know how to do it and can do so without fear of punishment. I have learned over the years, though, working with the DEA and with the National Association of Attorneys General, that this phenomenon that we call the chilling effect, and we all think is horrible, it is not viewed that way by law enforcement. They think it is wonderful because they feel like it helps them do their job. So I, I want to be empathic with physicians. It's not, I've heard a bazillion times from docs, it's not your license on the line, it's not your livelihood on the line, no. But physicians have esteem in our society because of your commitment to patients and because of the sacrifices and the risk you make every day to make us a healthier population. So I, I'm sure I'm sounding really snarky here right now, but I think we have to get our fears understood by what they really are. And then, Lynn, I'd ask you to jump in and say, oh, Myra, your license is not on the line. Oh, Myra, your license is not on the line. <laughs> and, and Myra knows this because she's read my book. Um, I devote a chapter to your concerns because I'm hoping that, uh, that, that that particular chapter is going to help um, people who care for people with chronic pain or those who have chronic pain or one day will understand what you've just said. I've, done, I've, I've tried my best to represent what you've just said because in uh, August of 2010, the DEA came into my office with a subpoena to get records from our clinic. And uh, they held that over my head while I was president of the American Academy of Pain Medicine and, uh, met and, you know, and basically gave uh, comments to national reporters about me um, to the extent that it compromised my ability on a national basis. So I know firsthand how painful it is to be somebody that the DEA came in to look at charts from our clinic. Now, no charges ever. Eventually dropped after four years a letter from the Attorney General, which they don't often do anymore. They just come in and get charts and then, and if the reporter wants to say doctor has been investigated, it could be there for the rest of your career. And you have to always say yes, unless you get a letter and say that it is no longer an issue. It is a real issue, Myra. It is a real serious issue for those of us, and particularly when it happened to me, because it, the, the headlines was, you know, this big doc in the country under investigation has a uh, reverberating effect. My community knew about it, I, and, and I had calls from the East Coast and the West Coast within two hours after the DA entered my office, asking if the, from docs if they could help me in any way. It's a real issue. Now, the real issue probably isn't the DEA, it's the medical boards. And it's not about discipline, it's about the process that is so intimidating and fearful for doctors because it is degrading for us to know that somebody thinks, I mean, our, challenge, our integrity has been compromised uh, and they're questioning whether our intent is legitimate. I hear you. If you buy the book or get the book, read the chapter that echoes what you, your concerns are. And I did it so people understand there is a concern that they need to be aware of and why we act sometimes the way we do in not writing a script or ordering a test. Anyone else? Uh, yes, hi, T Teresa Perry, um, one of the pains patients of the, uh, our project that we have going on. And I wanna say thank you for this because this has been one of my outs through my process. I'm sitting up here now probably with some others in pain, I also been in a car accident since, so my back, my neck, my hands, even to hold this. But one thing I wanted to say is, like you said, even about the pills, I stopped taking them two years ago because of a doctor. I mean, the doctor was like, they took a test on me and seen, 
I had stopped taking them for a minute, but you put me on morphine, hydrocodone. You put me on all of it at one time. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, hold on. My hair has came out up here. You know, just um, I try to just keep going in the community, just doing things to not think about my life sometimes. So sometimes I don't want to be on the medicine, but I will stop. You know, probably see me get up twice, go take an ibuprofen, and then I'm also on... Uh, antibiotics right now because you have other stuff that goes on sometime when you take this medicine. So it's a lot that play into this. So I'm just hoping it'd be something where, thank God I said for the Pains Project, they don't pay me to say this. Anytime they need me, I'm going to be here because they have really been there for me. I mean, it was at one point where I wouldn't even come out of my house for like a couple of years. And I just get very emotional about this. I mean, I would come out. I would just be like, okay, no, it's things going on out there. Now you could barely get me to stay in. Now that's another thing I'm trying to deal with. I mean, see, I, I'd rather go sit in the seat, be in pain, and listen, and try to help out, you know, show people. Sometimes maybe it's, I'm in denial, you know, but I'm still taking like two antibi two, you know, ibuprofens or something to keep moving to not deal with it or say this is what I'm facing, you know. But I hope it is something that the doctors, you know, us as a community and pains projects, different programs like that, to get to some type of thing where, hey, we can try to make it, you know, fair across the board. Because I think we've been at this, what, my three years, you all, or something, five? See? I mean, I don't know. But I just, I think that's why I keep coming, because I know one day it's going to be a change. And I pray it be a change for all of us, because it do affect your life. Very well. Thank you. Thank you. For sharing that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Your question over here. And by the way, uh, you don't have to take morphine to lose your hair. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say, as a clinical psychologist and a clinician, we need to operate on data. And what our physician was talking about was over 15 minutes, how much data can she collect about information beyond the physical, medical kind of thing. And therefore, she's not in position either by time to collect the proper data, nor <clears throat> by training to be able to interpret that data. And I think to hold physicians responsible for that part of it is, is beyond the pale and, not, and, and diverts all of our attention away from looking at pain. Pain is pain. It's mediated through the same pain receptors, regardless of where it is and what it seems to be coming from. And so we need to, from this, I would hope we'd all take the fact that it's about pain, regardless of its source. It's not just have to do with using chemical means to treat chemistry. We have, we know that chemistry and blood changes and all those occur as a result of a lot of very psychological or spiritual factors, you may call them. And so we need to look at the total picture just because it, it seems to end up in the neurochemical area. It doesn't mean that's the source. And so we need to look at pain as pain, not just from the standpoint of, of the opioids. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Okay, you get the last one. My name is Shelley Purdy. I'm a hospice nurse, hospital liaison, and I do see a lot of, um, I go out and, and see the patients in the hospital prior to admit in hospice. And a lot of the patients, their symptoms are not managed. And it's a rush to get them to the hospice house because once they have that terminal status, then they can have their symptoms managed, and it's sad. Yeah, that it, it, it is sad. That, that's why we need everyone speaking up. That's why the Berkeley Symposium is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Myra, thank you for putting all of this together. And John, thank you for allowing me to be here today as well. And of course, Kathleen, you, you are everyone's mentor in the field, so thank you.